G'day, soil lovers. You're listening to Secrets of the Soil podcast. I wanted to create a podcast that each week we had the opportunity to dig deep on some of the secrets of the soil. A podcast that gave our soils a voice. So here we are, sharing secrets of the soil with me, your host, Regen Ray. We would like to acknowledge the traditional landowners of which this podcast is being recorded on and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Hello, soil lovers, and welcome back to another episode of Secrets of the Soil. I'm super excited to be digging deeper into our soils. We've been joined by a guest from across the ditch. Ewan, welcome to our podcast. Hi there. Glad to be glad to be here. Excellent. Share with our soil loving community who you are and what you work on. Uh, yeah, well, a bit of a deeper question. Um, I'm a farmer, really, and I was brought up on a peat farm, uh, which my father broke in from a piece of scrub in a swamp. So he made a farm, and we learned a lot about soils and how to do shit. Um, although I, when we turned into being dairy farmers on a peat farm. I stayed for a certain amount of time, but I just didn't want to be ploughing paddocks and milking cows and everything. So I bought uh, bought our own farm in Waihe, which is about 40 k's from where I grew up. Um, most beautiful part of the world, great climate, shit soil. I, did, I didn't put that on the prerequisite before <laughs> I left and got there. So um, once got there, had to make it work and... was lucky enough to meet people that posed the question and I asked more questions and I drove some people mad um, (laughs) until they couldn't answer and then I had to move on to the next questions and along the way I got invited to uh, join Brookside Laboratories from Ohio in the States to train with them which was an absolute godsend. Uh, With that I could test and measure everything I was doing on the farm so um, we had many, many episodes of, you know, what was going on and how people wanted to continue the process. You know, people turned up, uh, fertiliser companies, and say, ah, oh, you know, look, you just need to put some more super on. And I developed this moron theory. Well, <laughs> if I was going to put more on, I was going to be the moron. So, um, Love that. so I tested and measured everything. And... I, I, after I'd learned what was what, I threw that away and just carried on from because I could see the visual response. So uh, we went on with a beef farm and we started marketing our own beef because it was outstanding quality, won some national food awards and, yeah, started supplying probably the top 10 restaurants in New Zealand. Uh, and with that, a whole lot of farmers said, what the hell are you doing? Um so business started. They came and had a look at the farm and they're going, this is all upside down. You're saying shit that no one else is saying and it's actually the opposite to what we've been told. You have long pastures, you have plants that look like weeds, you have rotations and everything's wrong, but it worked. And you'd give them a steak and they'd go, oh, shit. <laughs> Whatever we're doing, we're doing it wrong. So that started. Um yeah, and that was the the door that opened the box. You know, I was learning stuff all the time. Uh, I think the biggest thing after learning with Brookside was that it was such a cool, it is such a cool organisation. It allows me to test and measure everything I want to, and I, the parameters of what we test is quite wide. Um, but what it taught me was that mineralogy wasn't everything. Uh and the biggest kicker of all, because we didn't have any money at the time, I used a product called Basic Slag, and that came out of Glenbrook Steel Milk um, just, just south of Auckland. I, I bought it because it was 5% magnesium, 30% calcium, and 1% phosphorus. It was cheap, and you know it cost me $90 a tonne spread on the farm, and effectively it was $200 worth of nutrients. So like it, I bought it as a cost-effective way of getting around things but what happened oh, was just remarkable um it changed the farm and effectively we probably grew 100 percent more grass and healthy grass the red clover came up but there was never every sign of it ever before wow so um and one day 
at this stage we were making mineral licks and he, we talked about Pat Colby before and I'd read a lot of her stuff and I'd been looking at all these different mineral mixes and I was making these mixes and I decided to put a little bit of kelp meal in just to see what would happen because a lot of people were saying how good this kelp was to make a difference. And uh, in he we get some pretty heavy rainfall um, events. If, if you get a depression off the coast of Brisbane and it drops down over New Zealand, we, we can get six inches of rain in a night. So in the fish bin in the morning where I put all the minerals, there was probably only half a teaspoon of kelp left there and the drum was full of water, but all the kelp was lined up running exactly east-west, 27 millimetres apart. And it was like the mice had been out and set up their Olympic swimming pool and were ready to go to... And I just like, oh, what is this? I was like, how do you explain that? Mm. So that set me on a um, platform to work out how the hell this happened and what was it. And um, what I'd inadvertently done with the basic slag and the conditions in our soil was actually set up a solar panel in the soil. It runs from east to west. The magnetite, which came from the iron sands, on the, which was part of the slag, it actually joins um, end to end like little magnets and lines across the soil in which the electricity runs through it. And I found that forms of silica created electrical energy that ran down it and then the research really went to town um you know davis and rawls phil callahan all about electromagnetic effects um you know trips to acres usa um driving people more mad uh, you know solar panel experts uh you know just you name it i was in there and um probably took me about 12 to 15 months to fathom the process that UV light was coming in, it was reacting with the silica in the soil, soil. it creates heat light and electricity. And with that, the current stimulates biology and it moves nutrient into the plant. And hey ho, you've got really healthy plants, you grow more carbon. In. And yeah, that was my like, whoa. Wow. This is, this is pretty out there, you know? Yeah, I love that. And, 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 and I think that's, um, you know, is this kind of like where the whole principle of like grounding comes from, like earthing your house and grounding yourself? Is it all in, interconnected with the same information that you found? I, I, I'd have to agree. It's all part of it. You know, like I think the, the part that it showed me was that Earth, Earth has a natural electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. And the closer you get to the poles, naturally it gets higher and higher. So, in the soil where I live, if you can get 0.25 of a volt running east-west, that's pretty good. But if I go down to uh, Southland in Vicargo, I'll get to 0.6. Mm-hmm. And um, the higher, highest I've ever seen has been in North Wales and Britain, I go up to 1.5 volts. So it's a hell of a lot of energy going through your soil, which changes the seasonality and the speed that things grow. So, you know, like the, the pennies were dropping all over the place. Yeah. And... Um, people can feel this stuff and I was putting it into context. Yeah. Cause I, I you know, I love science. Yep. I, just, you know, I just, just love the numbers and the facts and the figures and the, you know, not normal sort of the way I look at it being told what to do. I just yeah. like, how does that work? And yeah. And away you go. Yeah. That curiosity. I love that. And you mentioned while you were explaining then about how you were doing farming upside down, what intrigued you to do it differently? Was it, because you saw other mentors or were you just wanting to play around with what you were seeing and trying something different? What, what created you to have an upside down farm? Well, that was the thing about growing up on the peat farm. <laughs> we had, there, there was nothing before us. So we walked into a clean slate and you only did what worked. Yep. You didn't do what other people told you to do. It's like someone say, oh, you need to put a shitload of that stuff on and go, oh, well, we'll try a little corner and it didn't work and go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was trial and error. And, and we did things because we were the masters of our destiny. And uh, when I moved across to the farm in Waihe, I mean, I didn't have any money. And it's like uh, empty pockets sharp in the mind. Yeah, You know, like uh, most farmers are under the pump at the moment, so they're looking. 
Yeah, I love that. That empty mind sharpens because that's where you become resourceful. You think I can't do it this way. Let me think of another solution. It's very easy just to go and keep paying for a, for a product or service, but it's when that money dries up or a crisis point happens that you start thinking differently. You know, and so many of the uh, leaders of the regenerative movement have all come from a crisis point. You know, and I just hope that people can see that they can prevent that and learn from from mm. their experience. You also touched on visual. You mentioned about, you know, visually seeing what was happening on your farm. How important is it, those visual above-the-ground signals um, in your oh, world? Look, it's, it's up above and below. But, I mean, it, the, the visuals are massive because when you see it, you go, you say, what happened there? Mm. Then you investigate it. Without you seeing it, you don't know something's going on. And, uh, you know, Albrecht... <laughs> He, he's a fantastic quote. He says, read books and study nature. If they don't agree, throw away the books. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, use he, that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. You know, and, and we take that on board. I mean, I, Albrecht was one of the greatest researchers. And yet, if you really look deeply, he looked at what was working. You know, he could see what was working. Then he dove in to find out how it was working and what mm. was going on. Yeah. So that's how he found the best soils in the world. Yeah, they were working. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, a lot of uh, material is coming forward now about First Nation and how they observed and just sat with nature. And I think you know, a lot slowing down and getting off the tractor and doing these visual assessments is is becoming a lot more popular. And you can't you can't argue when there's a fence line between two different methods and one side's green and one side's brown. You just think, oh, let me, what, what's 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 going on here? You know, there's that visual cue. And unfortunately, humans, you know, seeing is believing. Um, and that's, um, you know, yeah, even then though, you know, the programming of our growing up and our, how we do things is still the biggest challenge. I mean, I've been at field days where we showed people stuff and they go, Oh, and I, I remember my dad sidling up to this guy and he says, well, what do you think? And he says, shit, if I could believe what I'm seeing, it's bloody amazing. <laughs> And so, yeah, you know, we had another instance probably only about a month ago where the neighbour next door, um, Floppy, I call him, <laughs> he used to play rugby with him, but he comes screaming up the road to Dad and he said, he's done it again. He goes, what do you mean? He said, he took one of the weediest farms in the bloody district and cleaned it up without any sprays. And there's no weeds on your place either. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, they, they can see it. Um, but sometimes they're a bit slow on the movement of what's next, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. And do you think it's just an education? Like what is the next step? Is it being held, you know, accountable by a mentor of some sort or is it just um, people are easy to stick with what they know, you know, path of least resistance? A lot of it's fear. Okay, yep. Um, huge amount of fear, especially in the people with mortgages in the dairy industry, you know, the, the, the dairy NZ tell them what they have to do and how they have to do it and they feel safe even though it might not feel right it's not working that well they, they still oh well we just better go there you know yeah it's it's not until they step off the treadmill and go shit there was another way mm. Mm. yeah so money and fear are mm. when we see that a lot in society right at the moment don't we yeah absolutely and and it's very interesting that you know people can feel that it's not right but yet there's this in you know humane I intuition of like just being safe, and that trumps even something that doesn't feel right. You know, like safety and protection, and follow the bouncing ball in the system, and we will be okay. You know that there's a lot of comfort in that. Um, it just it, it it highlights, I guess, from my point of view, how out of touch we are with our intuition and, and our feeling, which is also meant to be a guiding star or a way of knowing you know what to do next. You know that, that the common thing like this doesn't feel right or that place feels shady you know like it's a protective mechanism um yeah, yeah. i i couldn't agree more i say like people don't you know like a lot of things and i i saw it in the agriculture a farmer would turn up to a discussion group and he'd talk to the thing and say look i saw that over there and whoever was running it, it just cleaned the floor with them because it didn't fit their narrative and they'd saunter off and like this and um, i'm a bit different like i if I saw something, it was up to me to go and find out what it meant. And if somebody tried to wipe the floor with me, I'd just go, you should get your shit sorted out because this is how it works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's best to be armed with technology and the ability to do things. Um, most people don't back themselves. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we live in a world where that's how we're kind of trained. And you know, sit in the corner, do the right thing, put your hand up when you you want to ask a question. And you know, and and you know, we we're conditioned that way. So I'm I'm glad that more and more people are questioning that narrative and breaking that mold. Um, I, I know your journey has led you on to writing a book. Why why did you write the book? And tell us a little bit more about what's in the book and what it's all about. Yeah, um, well, a book, like, it was actually some clients said, well, why don't you write this down? And um, again, oh. so one day I, I sat down with nothing to do when I started. And it, it's been a, a, a longish process, but I guess the thing was is it saved me from being that toy that just said the same thing again and again and again and kept telling people the same thing over and again. So now uh, it's like the book, just backgrounds my journey, where I came from, how I got to where I learned what I learned. I mean, there's so many crazy stories in there that people just, oh, Christ, of course, that's exactly what happens. I mean, um, one of the ones that really comes to mind to me that people laugh their heads off is the one about the ragwort. Where I was pulling ragwort on the farm and I could see all these beautiful worms and this fungi and it was fantastic. And I thought, bloody hell, I've got to have some more of this. And uh, mm-hmm. an old friend uh, Tom Harris, who's now passed away, he was a good bugger. He used to um, put a lot of fungi in his fish emulsions that he was making. So I thought, oh, I'll try this, putting this in the fish, and I'll throw this on the farm. And So this is great. And it was really interesting because it only took four days, and it took all the smell out of the fish. You could, it didn't have a, a pong anymore. So the helicopter came, and it sprayed it on. It was all good, you know, and you know, things were all right. But come the springtime, all of a sudden there's all these ragwort plants started coming up over the whole farm and flipping heck, all of a sudden I had 900 acres of ragwort and <laughs> yeah, God, it was like Van Gogh's summer flowers had shown up and it was just like, oh shit, what did I do? Mm. And it showed, it was just an experience where people can see, look what happens when specific fungi hit a specific environment. They just went and germinated every ragwort farm seed on the farm. And, and I was like, oh, crikey. <laughs> so I had to grin and bear it for a couple of years as it went through the cycle and disappeared out the far end. And um, mm. But those are experiences. People have seen things like that in the past, but they've never been able to put the, the one and one together and so when they leave that I mean I get jabbed in the ribs you going can I put any flowers out this year you want <laughs> no, no but you know these are the experiences that I went through and I documented them and I can you know just show you that there's lots of ways to skin a cat yep and it, it can be fun and it can be trying at times too but you know I hope that it was going to save a lot of people a lot of harassment for yes. themselves. Yep. <laughs> it's not me, wives. it's the book told me to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, you've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, what it gets down to at the end of it really is we got to the point where we got really good at what we do. Um, it's taken a long time, but we got really, really good at what we do and we're accumulating large sums of carbon. Um, we regularly accumulate between seven and 25 tonnes per hectare per year on bearing farms around New Zealand. And, you know, if we do get paid for this, it's massive. But Mm. as far as an environmental thing goes, it's documenting how our water that's leaving the farm is down to such low nitrate levels that we're environmentally friendly as well. Yeah, yeah. And I love that as well with that whole, um, you know, if you get paid for it, awesome. And if not, it's just really good for the ecosystem and the environment and the hydration and, and all the other benefits that come come with it um we 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 we, with our soil lovers we talk about the word regenerative a lot do you have any opinions about this word and what does it mean to you um well i think i started before it it was even thought of to tell you the truth and and um i'm probably a bit of a red mech because i don't actually follow the the prescribed you know theological process of this um Look, it's brilliant what people are doing. They're starting to learn. I was telling people 20 years ago they needed to graze better. Yep. You know, we'd come off a place where we we had beef cows and we used the beef cows to clean the scrub and the uh, rushes from the land using grazing methodology. So we, I knew about that. First thing I did when I got to Waihee on this big block was put fences and water everywhere. Um, 
But at that point, I realised the soil was really important. And a lot of people are going down this regenerative track and they're not looking at the soil at the same time. They're saying, oh, well, if we get the right species and we cross it down, and I go, if you don't fix what's underneath first, you won't, won't do anything. You'll just cause more havoc. And you'll spend a lot of money mm. on seed and a whole lot of stuff if you don't actually take notice of what's going on. Yep, I, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, you know, hanging out with Farming Secrets and Helen and Hugo and what they've been able to see with this industry. Back then, there was no sexy word called regenerative ag um, and everyone seems to be jumping on it. And there are, is a lot of fear in the in the um, industry of whether it's going to be hijacked. And, you know, if we start talking about certification and all these frameworks that it, it, it doesn't really align with, you know, looking at nature and letting nature be your source of truth and say, this is what I'm observing, I need to do this, you know. And the whole principles and practices of what Regen Ag is could get very messy. And um, so I definitely agree with you that it's all about the soil and um, that is the reason why we started this podcast. And, you know, Secrets of the Soil is all about let's educate about what's happening below the ground, what's normally out of sight and out of mind and really get, you know, people interested in that side of the world um, because that's our true North Star, you know. You can do whatever you want above the ground, but if you're not nurturing below the ground, it means absolutely nothing. Um, yeah. So I, I agree with with that. And a lot of people worry that it's getting greenwashed. You know, big corporations are starting to put this on their packaging and not really know what it means, you know. So it's a... It's a anyway, we've got some great things coming up. You know, some of these scanners that I don't think it'll be that long before they'll be able to go on your phone and be able to scan the quality of food. That'll yep. be a... That'll be the end of the certification process. You're either you're good or you're not. End yep. of story. That's right. Uh, um, the other part that I suppose that I've got on to understanding the soil, the electrical effect and what it has on biology and the toxicities and things that we need to clean up. But what I'd like to throw to people is that the greatest carbon builder in the soil is cyanobacteria. End of story. You can, you can trample grass down on the ground, but if the soil's not there ready to be the receiver of that trash and break down the roots and all that sort of stuff, you know, good, but you had, first of all, you had to photosynthesize the grass before you could actually put it in the ground. Mm. Well, those cyanobacteria, they're the greatest oxygenators on the planet. They're in the ocean and they're quite happy living in our soils. They don't like aluminium and they don't like poisons. Mm. So no sprays and you've got to get the aluminium out of the profile. So the right fungal species, and they will do stuff for you that you just can't even imagine. And, and this, all this multi-species crops and all this other stuff is like, forget it. It's, you can save yourself a freaking fortune if you can get those guys working. Yeah. So share a little bit more. I'd love to go a bit deeper on that. Like how do you encourage that bacteria? And, um, and, 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 and you've said the word very quickly, so I haven't been able to catch on how to say it. So if you want to repeat, repeat it for our soil. Cy- cyano. Cyano. Bacteria. Bacteria. Awesome. So now – these guys are hardy as far as climate goes. They live in the desert, and so when it rains, it's those guys that provide the nitrogen for the great bull. Um, in the ocean, if you look at the poles, just as spring comes and the melt comes and you get this massive boom of life, that's them. It's those guys that kick off, then the shrimps, uh, the krill, everything else goes from there. So they are prolific in the right circumstances and they're not so um they're not that worried about the temperature being hot or cold so we grow more here in the winter time in the cold period of the year like we can you can watch the carbon levels go up and the, you walk across the soil and it's like a carpet where all the worm castings are mm. and those guys are gobbling that cyanobacteria bring it to the surface and round and round it goes so what we do is we're using various seed products you can use seawater um to bring them in because they're prolific in the ocean, but they have to have a clean environment. They really do. I mean, you, you've got to have a good fungal set that's cleaned up the toxins, uh, uh, past chemical residues and stuff like that before they'll go. But when you get them to go, there's nothing like them. Awesome. I just cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Speechless. Well, they, they, well they're this, they were the first organism on earth. Right. Um, and they have so many amazing properties. They'll restrand their DNA back to the original format. So you've got a process there that will allow you to correct defects in the genetic sequence. Right. 
Love that. You know, n- and, nature heals, nature repairs. You know, it's that's just... it. And those guys can do it. And um, there's other technologies that um, they've taken from it where they can actually found that they can introduce viruses and bacteria into the cyanobacteria and then it, it makes them a killer cell to all that uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria and viruses. So if you feed these guys right, you go, oh, shit, we've got a really bad bug coming to the population. No, we'll just go and spray it on the farm and the food that we produce from that will then be the remedy to what was going on. It's like nature is so cool. Yeah. So- and yet they're trying to um, take it and you know, make money out of it. Mm. But it, what it was, it was so funny. I, I, I can't tell you the documentary I was watching about it, but it, it's called CRISPR technology. And they just clip a, a de- the DNA of the cyanobacteria, inserts that DNA of the pathogenic cell, and then it goes, oh, that one, kill, kill, kill. Right. Couldn't ask for better. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, yeah, there's so many, um, so many uh, of our world solutions have come from nature and then we either have lost tr- track of that and not even realise that that's where it comes from, um, you know, and, and, and so we've, we've just so become disconnected from nature. We don't even question where some of the, the things that we do live by day by day comes from, you know, and um, yeah, we, it, it, it's definitely an interesting world and what a great world we live in as well where we can just explore this stuff deeper. You know, you can jump onto the internet and, and dig oh. deeper and research it and I, that can be a dangerous rabbit hole as well because you get conflicting advice but it really empowers you to bring power back to you where you can go, oh, I like that, that resonates and you can make your own assumptions. What was it like when you were trying to expand this to people and there wasn't this kind of internet world and like did you just have to build a really close community in your local area or did you travel around and spread it to whoever wanted to listen? Um, no, it was funny actually because I, um, I had been trying to get the meat board to help sponsor some research I was doing at the time and they wouldn't do it. But because I'd won these national food awards, the magazine then called the meat producer came along and said, Oh, we'll do an interview on your farm. So they had an interview and then all these people from around the country rang me up and said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I go, oh, free advertising. Yeah, yeah. that's that's so, that's marketing. <laughs> it's marketing, yeah. They came and they looked and um, then I sort of went out to see their farms and have a look and look for resources and it just grew. And um, we did a video once and, and that video just went everywhere. So like that was the internet at the time. It just got handed on here and there and everywhere. And it just, it went nuts, but you know, it went so nuts that the bureaucracy thought, shit, we've got to stop this bugger. Wow. Um, he's causing trouble. So, you know, we had our, we've had our time with the, the government and their, you know, pseudo scientists and all that sort of stuff. And I suppose it's not to be looked at that. I'm really pissed off about it. They, they made me, go and research more. They made me get better and better at what we we're doing. So I got to thank them. I'd rather have not had it, but yeah, there's always a silver lining, you know, and uh, I often say to people all the time, like, don't believe anything you hear, like go and fact check it yourself, go learn it yourself, you know, and don't rely mm. on a third party to be your fact checker, like make your own assumptions. That's really, you know, the, 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 the power of what we have to do is be able to think for ourselves and, and research topics deeper and deeper until we're content. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and so like within your book, is it more of a, these are the steps to take or is it more of a resource manual where people can go to different parts? Do you read it from start to end or is it more of a resource guide? Uh, well, it's a story really yeah. with all the things that we found and how they impact. And then there's a bit of, there's quite a summary about how they all fit together and, and you can mold it all together and, and make it work. Um, like it's a journey. I think the fungal species or fungal inoculum that we make now, I think we've got around 17 or 18 species that I know of in there now. Mm. Um, but I picked them up over 15 years saying, Oh, look what that's doing over there. I think we need to try that. And Oh, look what that's doing over there. And, you know, like even though we have the internet and that sort of stuff, the likes of Acres USA at the time when Charles Walters was running it, you know, the book resources, the people that he had drawn together, extraordinary. Um, I mean, if anybody's been the foundation of regenerative agriculture, it was Charles Walters. Yep. Yeah, by by a long way. Yeah. Yep. And and people don't talk enough about the, the gentleman. 
um, he did a remarkable job. Yeah, and and was it because of the way that he curated the content and the people and the topics, or was it his team? Yeah, his... That, he was a good writer, but he he was such an investigative little bugger. He, right. he was into everything, you know. Like I remember seeing the first article about Maynard Money's Murray's Sea Energy and Agriculture splattered across the front of, and I was like. Whoa, you know, um, it wasn't that long after that we ended up with a helicopter spraying seawater onto the farm and um, and seeing some of the remarkable things and just being able to take it on and um, Richard Olry's Minerals for the Genetic Code and, and things like that. It's just remarkable research um, processes and he could see it. He, mm. he could actually go, wow, that's really important. I need to get that in there. And it would open a huge discussion and... Uh, yeah, he, he really set the platform. Yeah, yeah. And so in the work that you do, I'm assuming you help a lot of people in your community and so forth. In this space, like how important is it to have others that are supportive and maybe like a bit of a mentor relationship? Like do you, do you, I, feel, I meet a lot of people who feel alone in this space and they're like they're the, the one in the community that's doing it the crazy way or their grass is a fire risk and everyone's, you know, demonising them for it. Like... How, how do people get supported through that? Like, is mentorship a big thing? Um, I think the communities are slowly coming together in, in that regard. And, and um, information is king. I mean, the, the thing about the book is that uh, and website and the videos I do and that sort of stuff, that people can sit in their own home and actually make their own mind up, as you say. And then all of a sudden they'll be talking to somebody and they'll go, did you see that? Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, the little fires start to burn, the little piles of smoke, and a little aerial get cranked up. And, um, you know, resetting the business three years ago and that, and, and you, you see those little embers that never went out. They were still looking for things and they wanted more information. And they're, um, they're quite funny, actually. The ones that have been around the longest, I've worked with a long time, they, they look at this regenerative thing and they sort of scratch their head and they're going, you, you were saying that 20 years ago. I'm going, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but now it's sexy. <laughs> it's sexy, yeah, yeah. And so I've got grey hair now and I didn't back then. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the formula. <laughs> <laughs> it must be. Yeah. Look, um, social media is amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're talking to people all the time, you know, I'm a, you know, I post a bit of stuff, but I, I quite often put a lot of comments into people when they're asking some reasonably good questions or some really silly shit, I'll, I'll sort of point them in another direction, but yeah, um, it is a good, it's a good platform. It's amazing how many are watching and never say anything. Yes. Ghost viewers, we call them now. People that okay. just, yeah, there's a word for it. There's people who just watch your stuff, but they never comment, they never subscribe, they never like. <laughs> you know, they just yeah, they're like one a day ghost. They rig up, but they're, they're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, Where'd you come from? You <laughs> ghost in the closet. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I, and I wonder whether like there is some nervousness with people when they discover this space to go, oh, I don't know if I really want to like this page, and you know, it's align myself with that. Um, but or whether it's just people are really happy to declutter their mind of how many pages they belong to and just curate th themselves, you know. Um, um, I, I'd have to say that given what happened when the Commerce Commission came after me, it, it's a frightening experience to put your head up and say, hey, I've found something. Yeah. Um, and yet in today's world with, you know, the groups that are out there, it's a lot easier to say those things. Um, and this, but there's still people that are stuck in mainstream agriculture that are looking and they don't want to be seen by their mates that they're looking. Yep. And it's quite surprising how many of them are and they just haven't said anything. Yep, yep. And, and I admire people who do put their hand up. I saw a post on Facebook this morning where, you know, someone said, look, I'm a traditional farmer. i am got all these inputs going on and... Um, I want to explore this regen ag thing deeper and like, where do I start and what do I learn? And, you know, and, and so the curiosity there, and I feel like we're past that tipping point of the majority understanding that there is a different way uh, move, moving forward. And you've spoken about carbon a, a little and, and, and using nature to build up that carbon. Um, wh why are you focus so much on carbon? Do you use that as like your North star or the signal of how the soil's performing or one of them? Uh, hmm. I don't, uh, I suppose it's a tool to help farmers realize that you can do this 
and then you think they're threatening you with with methane and all that sort of stuff. It's great. You've already got that in your bank. You know, the amount of grass you'll grow more because you've got it is yeah. another thing. The amount of moisture that you can hold because of it and the you know, how fast your passes will spring back because it's there. Mm. Um, but it is an indicator. Um, and there's plenty of other indicators too. I guess it's the the buzzword at the moment mm, um, going right. around the around yeah. the traps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so soil tests really important for you? Like, yeah. Yep. Like one of the things that I do that I don't think many do is to, we do two tests. We do uh, what you'd call a chemical melt. We want to know everything in your soil and we do the availables. And with that, we can actually look at the limiting factors. Like most people haven't understood how damaging aluminium is to soil. Um, and they don't understand the effect that past used to superphosphate. Now, I know New Zealand's had a big use of superphosphate. I think Australia has as well, as a lot of parts of the world. Mm. When that goes on, it solubilizes the aluminium, and it takes the hydroxide off silica. So the mechanism to remove aluminium in the soil is gone. Big problem. So mm-hmm. if you're going biological farming after that, and you don't do anything about getting rid of the aluminium toxicity, just go down the supermarket and have a look at the antiperspirants. Yep. They're all aluminium based. They're all kill off. You know, it's, it's simple science. So I suppose when you look at it and that contents the book revokes my observations technology and it gives you enough technology and science to, to go, oh, actually, this makes a lot of sense. Yep. Technically, it's right and so when we bring these total and available soil tests up you can actually see when you see the sulfur levels fall you go biology is not working you'll see it correspond with the available nitrogens um you know there's boom 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 okay you got that and you can see what sort of soil you've got and what the the things are that you need to go and attend to and with that you know when the biology will start to respond for you so soil samples are seriously important and they need to be seriously accurate. We do GPS, um, you know, test uh, two levels down to 300 mils to do the carbons at the same time. Um, just accuracy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, I, you know, I'm a data person and you've spoken a little bit about that. I love tracking and measuring and putting it into a spreadsheet and seeing the charts. Um, so I get very excited about the number of apps that are appearing that can help you solve the these problems on your farm and in the paddocks and take photos and log it all in like a journal. And I think that's um, super exciting because what you track, you, you can ma- measure and manage. So um, I, I'm a big believer of soil tests and, you know, just even you like explaining that, like such a simple thing, like sometimes the answers are right in front of us. Your deodorant has aluminium in it, you know, like why is that? Because it kills the bacteria that causes the smell under your armpit. And then that makes sense. It's like, well, if that's in your soil, it has to be killing the bacteria, like such a lo- logical joining of dots and mm. sometimes the answers are right in front of our faces, but we're not looking for it and we prefer to ignore it, you know. And so that that is a, you know, penny drop moment for me as well because m- many years ago I removed, you know, detoxed my life a little bit and I removed aluminium deodorants, but I still didn't right. join that dot. Like I knew about the aluminium in deodorant, but I never realised that it had that same kind of effect in our soil. So this is why I love doing these podcasts because soil lovers along with you, I'm learning a lot as well. And I love this, you know, co-creation space that we've created here with our podcast. And so we're deep in the soil and the soil tests. So you and I want to ask you if you were the voice of our soils, what would you tell us here on earth? Look, um, the soil has a memory. It, it's reminded of everything that's gone on it. And it's done it in a technical sense because silicon is a computer chip, Mm -hmm. just the same as the water molecule. It retains a memory when something's gone on it chemically, physically, it remembers. And until you sort your soil out and get the right biology to clean that mess up, that imprint stays Mm -hmm. and you are revisiting the sins of your fathers. I can tell you that now. And so we've been lucky enough to find enough fungal species that when stimulated by the electrical activity, they will clean the slate. It's called (laughs) Control-Alt-Delete. I love that. That is so good. And so when you do that and you get rid of that aluminium toxicity by using certain forms of um, hydrated silicas, volcanic silicas, you can put back the minerals that are required, the biology that's required, 
and it will play a merry tune for you forever. Yeah. As long as you look after it. I, I think that's really cool. It's like basically our souls have a really good long-term memory and they they remember everything that has been, you know, done to them, but they forget but they won't forgive until you repair them, you know. So that's, that's a, you totally. Know. And and the consequences that I saw from when I put the electricity into soils that had that memory, even though they had no chemical residues, it actually expressed it in the plants, and mm-hmm. it was like, holy, you know. And that's all in the book. It's like the experiences that you know we've seen. No one else. You don't have to go through it. You just yeah. I can tell you, it's 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 out there. <laughs> I love that. You've got lots of stories and shared lots of information. You and it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today and digging deeper into our wonderful world of soils. How can our soil lovers and farming community get to hang out with you a little bit more? Where can they see your content and ah, your stuff? Okay. Yeah, so we're, we've got a website, EcoFarm AATRO, which we've re- rebooted and we're putting more and more videos in there and um, YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, I just get kicked more of the time. I mean, I need you on my side to actually put more content up there but yeah books available there although we'd like to make it available in australia if we can stable the postage and that and um yeah there's this we're talking with a few aussies already and i've spent a bit of time over there in the past i like the place you know <laughs> yeah well i don't know have you been post-covid could be a bit different <laughs> uh, yeah and no, i haven't been there for a while so yeah yeah no i love yeah. that i've really enjoyed our chat today and uh soil lovers all the links um where you can hang out with you and will be around the video in the show notes or if you're joining us for the video experience on the soil learning center.com. Well, it's been absolutely great chatting. I've learned a bucket load and I'm sure everyone else has as well. You and any final thoughts or parting bits of advice you'd like our soil lovers to think about? Um, don't hide in the corner. Mm-hmm. Love it. Get out there, get into it. <clears throat> awesome. Well, on that note, soil lovers, thank you very much for hanging out with us. Get outside and get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into our soils and get out of the corner. All right, until next time, keep curious. Well, soil lovers, that's enough secrets for one episode. I really hope that you enjoyed all the secrets shared during this conversation. But hey, let's not keep it a secret. Please share this podcast around and make sure that you like it and leave us a review because that really helps spread the secrets of the soil. Until next time, remember, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils.